Okay, now we are going to do the same with the bacterial cultures and susceptibility test for bacteria. Because we have been talking about this situation, the use of biopsies and not reaching a diagnosis. But the same happens with bacterial cultures and, and susceptibility tests. In many cases, you do a culture, you send sample for a culture, and then you apply the results of the culture and you use the antibiotic recommended, and the dog remains with the same problem. Eh? Let's see, let's begin with a, with a clinical case. This uh, American Bulldog, 40 years old, intact male. The dog is an atopic dog, has been diagnosed with atopic dermatitis, uh, currently is on treatment with oclacitinib, plus bathing with chlorhexidine shampoo. Um, they, the owners are not, are not perfect uh, in compliance, so they, they are just following more or less our guidelines, but not in a very, let's say, precise way. And then as a consequence, the dog presents episodes of alopecia and itching that was treated in the past with cefovexin subcutaneously. And now it's again with one of the episodes, it's showing again clinical signs with moderate pruritus. Here you see the patient. The dog has developed these spots. That we see all over the body. So this is a classic presentation in, in dermatology, multifocal alopecia. We know that this is, that we see this, that means folliculitis. That when dogs develop spots of alopecia, this is because the hair follicles are inflamed. There are a list of conditions that can cause this, starting with hemodicosis, dermatophytosis, bacterial folliculitis, but also immune mediated conditions, like, uh, for instance, alopecia areata. Sebaceous adenitis, leishmaniasis, there are many conditions that can cause this spot. The most common ones are probably the three first dermatocosis, dermatophytosis, bacterial folliculitis. Here in this case, when you look at the lesions carefully, at the spots of alopecia, you see that there are some crusting, some epidermal colorets, so it's more characteristic of bacterial pyoderma or folliculitis. In, in dermatophytosis, the number of lesions is much less. Uh, we know that it's not demodicosis because the dog has been scraped several times, is on a good treatment for demodex mites and other parasites. So you can do repeat the skin scraping see that is negative, and then you can take a cytology of the samples, and then they are not beautiful postules, but there are some epidermal colorets that we can sample, and then we see these neutrophils and cocci, intracellular cocci, extracellular cocci here, so very likely this is a bacterial folliculitis, secondary to atopic dermatitis. We know that in atopic dogs, there is a change in the epidermis, they express new adhesive molecules, and the Staphylococcus intermediates, that is a normal inhabitant of the skin of the dog, use this opportunity to colonize and then infect hair follicles and cause these epidermal colorates. So it's a very, let's say, common situation in the veterinary dermatology. Uh, relapsing superficial pyoderma, secondary to atopic dermatitis. Imagine that this will be a Staphylococcus intermedius, maybe a Staphylococcus schleiferi, maybe other Staphylococci, 5% of the cases, but in 75% of the cases, this will be Staphylococcus intermedius. And more or less, I can predict the susceptibility of these bacteria because we have a lot of information. But we also know that these bacteria now is changing and developing more and more resistances. So should we do that? Well, 
the current recommendations is that you can try empirical treatment with antibiotic, with systemic antibiotics, if this is a case with very specific conditions. It has never been treated before with antibiotics. It's a bacteria, or you suspect a bacteria that has a predictable behavior, yeah? and uh, you are not going to use for a very long period of time the antibiotic. But in other situations, you need to do a culture. Specifically, the culture is recommended when you suspect or have a risk of antibiotic resistance. For instance, if fluoroquinolones or beta-lactamic antibiotic have been used in the last year, if there is a history of relaxing pyoderma, these two are conditions that we have in our case, if you have a previous history of multidrug resistant or MRS infection, because we know that if the, the methicillin resistant uh, cassette, that is a mobile element, is in the surface of the dog in the past, it remains and move from one clone of bacteria to the other. So probably this dog will have a um, relapsing infection with um, methicillin resistant bacteria. And also, if you have deep pyoderma, because we are going to use a long treatment with antibiotics, or if we have uh, an infection with a microorganism that in the cytology looks like a rod, because we don't have too much information about the susceptibility of rods. So it can be, let's say, Burkholderia, Pseudomonas, and in these cases, we need to perform susceptibility testing. In our case, it's clear that we have been using antibiotics on this dog in the last year, and we have a story of relapsing pyoderma, so we need to do a culture and sensitivity. Yeah. So, and the, in this case, the culture and the susceptibility testing will be useful because we have a high risk of resistance. We will see the results in a moment. Yeah. So these tests are useful, but they are useful if they are performed and interpreted adequately. And in many cases, there are mistakes about the process and the interpretation of the results. So the first step, it's again sampling. And this is very important. Eh? The sampling technique depends on the type of lesions. And before sampling, we need to consider if we should discontinue the current antibiotic or not. If we should stop the antibiotic, if the patient is on antibiotics or not? The answer is depends. In superficial pyoderma, remember that this is a pyoderma that affects the uh, skin above the basement membrane, epidermis, hair follicles, but not dermis. And this is the case of mucoidentous pyoderma, intertrigo, skin fold pyoderma, bacteria folliculitis, exfoliative pyoderma, blah, 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 all these types of pyoderma, and not the deep pyodermas, folliculitis, furunculosis, uh, deep uh, diffuse pyodermas, mycobacterial infection, and so on. So in superficial pyoderma, discontinuing the antibiotic is not necessary. In our case, it's only a folliculitis, you don't need to stop the antibiotic. You can do the culture on treatment, on antibiotic. Why? Because we know that in the, well, as we are going to collect the sample from the skin surface, the accumulation of antibiotic in the epidermis or in satum corneum is very low. It's not able to inhibit the growth of the microorganism. This is different in deep pyoderma. We will see that. The sample is going to be collected from postules. If they are present, that's the best. We open a postule with a 27G needle, and then we sample the content of the postule. If we don't have a postule, and we only have epidermal colorates and scales and cross, we need to collect the sample from that. In these cases, I usually uh, moisturize a little bit the, the swab with sterile saline, and then I go above the crust and collect the sample from below. Before sampling, it's very important to do cytology in all cases. We need to compare the, what we have seen in the cytology 
with the results of the lab, of the bacteriology lab. So if we have beautiful postules, this is our target. We open the postule with a tiny needle, with um, in sterile conditions, open the postule, go with the swab, collect the sample from the postule, and then it's, this is sent to the lab. If we have only this beautiful epidermal colorette, then it's not so nice, but we can get a good sample from this. We simply moisturize the, the uh, cotton swab, the tip, and then we go on the periphery of that. So the bacteria are living here, not in the middle. They are living below this cross. So we lift a little bit the periphery of the epidermal colorate and collect the sample from the periphery of the epidermal colorate. Here you see better with a dermatoscope. So we will go, we will lift this and go below this because we know that these colorates, they are spreading um, in the periphery. This is where you have more likelihood to find the, the microorganism. The sample is put in a sterile medium and then cultural media for transportation and sent to the bacteriology lab. lab. In deep py uh, pyoderma, the sampling is it's different. In this case, first, we need to discontinue the antibiotic at least two days, better if you can stop for four days. Because in the dermis, that is a tissue with vessels, there is more accumulation of antibiotic. So if you collect a biopsy and you send the biopsy to the lab for culture, in the dermis there is enough antibiotic to inhibit, at least in some cases, the growth of your microorganisms. We will avoid sampling ulcerated and very crusted areas. And ideally, we will get a biopsy. So the best sample for a culture of a deep infection of the skin is a biopsy. Biopsy the skin, you, we have seen that with a punch under sterile conditions. And then this biopsy will be used for everything. We will have a part for histopathology in formalin and then one part will be sent for cultures, bacterial or fungal cultures. And even we can keep a part frozen for PCR in the future. Imagine that the histopaths suggest that you have a mycobacterial infection. The fungal culture will be negative. The bacterial culture can be negative at the beginning, but you can do PCR and detect that this is a mycobacteria there. So you can always keep a part frozen for molecular techniques. You can do the molecular techniques from the um, sample that is uh, conserved, preserved in formalin, but in, with some limitation. If you have frozen fresh tissue, it's much better for histopathology. If you want, for instance, to take type of neospora or toxoplasma or weird microorganisms, cariospora, then um, you probably need to, to have good frozen material. So again, you see, we split the sample into under sterile conditions, we remove the superficial part, and one sample can go for microbiology, yeah, excuse me, and then the other one for pathology formalin fixed, okay? If the biopsy is not possible, or the owner say, no, I don't want to spend so much money with a biopsy, and you have a deep pyoderma that you want culture and investigate, you can use the exudate coming from draining tracts. Yeah? In this case, don't simply swab the surface as we do with, a, with superficial pyoderma. Try to collect the exudate coming from the, from the dermis. And usually we clean the surface a little bit with, for, with alcohol, with 70% alcohol. And then you make some pressure and collect the sample exactly from new exudate after cleaning the surface. Because if you simply swap here, uh, you can collect bacteria from the environment or just from leaking from the oral cavity and so on. And again, in all cases, do cytology of the lesions. Huh? And then you will see which type of organism are you 
seeing or having in this patient. You will see, in this case, for instance, neutrophils, very degenerated, and then intracellular cocci. Beautiful. In some cases, usually in deep pyoderma, you will see a different situation. You will see a, a much more pyogranulomatose exudate. Uh, if you look at this slide, you see that there are, apart from the erythrocytes, there are many neutrophils. That's clear. But we see this second population of more pleomorphic cells that, you know, there are macrophages. So in deep pyoderma, you will find typically a pyogranulomatose exudate and not like in superficial pyodermas, this very purulent exudate with cocci. And also, paradoxically, in deep pyoderma, the number of cocci usually is lower. It's much more difficult to find cocci in deep pyoderma. Also, it seems that the, the say, the severity is higher. It costs to find the cocci, you see. They, they are extracellular and intracellular, but they are not so many because there is a big uh, exudate. Eh? So you know that the sample is cultured in the lab. Eh? Uh, they, the staphylococci, that is the main pathogen in the skin, uh, grows in medium-sized uh, colonies with uh, hemolysis in the blood agar, that is the classic uh, cultural media for staph intermediates and staph aureus. They have a tiny difference. The staph aureus is more golden or yellowish, and staph intermediates tend to create these tiny white colonies, very beautiful. They grow in two, three days. And then uh, the bacteriologist or the Clinical pathologies will give you the identification of the organism after doing some biochemistry, or in some cases, they use PCR to identify that it's really pseudo intermediates. So, the first part is is there a microorganism, a pathogenic microorganism, or not? With this part, you can have two problems. Problem one is that you have sent a sample thinking that there was an infection and the result is no growth, negative. Nothing grow in my sample. So this happens in some cases. If this is what uh, you are having, you have to first review all the process, the sample collection, the conservation, the transportation. In some cases, the sample was too many days waiting in your clinic before it was sent to the lab, or there was a mistake. Uh, if it's a, a deep pyoderma and the antibiotic treatment was not discontinued, this can be a, a, a problem. And in some cases, uh, probably uh, you are not taking the adequate sample in a deep pyoderma, so you need to consider taking a biopsy. And, and if all is negative, maybe it's really a real negative result. The reverse situation is also common. So you send a sample, and then you get different microorganisms. And you don't know if there is relevant or is a contaminant, a normal flora. How do I know that this is a pathogen? Well, there are no very good rules for that. So the number one is the clinical correlation. It's to see if this microorganism has been identified as a major pathogen. See, Staphylococcus intermediates is pretty clear. We know that this is a pathogen. It's an, what we call an opportunistic pathogen. But there are some others that it's not so clear. You will see a couple of examples. So the first thing is the clinical correlation with the microorganism. The second one is the amount of growth. Usually, the good bacteriology labs give you information about the rapid or let's say the time to grow and the intensity. They give you like pluses, three plus, and they give you staph to intermediates, four plus, meaning was a lot of staph to intermediates, the growth happened very quickly. Or they give you staph to intermediates, four plus, 
and then Enterococcus SPP 1 plus. They probably grow a little bit of that later, and it's probably not so important. It's a secondary microorganism. Finally, also the number of isolate. If you have several microorganisms and they all have been growing late, probably are contaminants, don't take in consideration. So look at this case, for instance. This is a bull terrier, three or four years old, that developed severe deep pyoderma frunculosis to this suppurative draining tracts on the head, neck, and trunk. One day, one, between one and two days after grooming, after bathing and grooming. The lesions are very painful. The dog is feeling a little bit uh, sick. And obviously, the guardians of the dog are really concerned about this. You suspect what is very classic, a post-grooming folliculitis, frunculosis, eh? based on the clinical presentation and the cytology, polymorphonuclear neutrophils, a few bacilli. And you sent a sample to the lab, and they answered you, Burkholderia cepacea, 3 plus, Enterococcus SPP, 1 plus. Are those the pathogens? Imagine that you are not very familiar with this bacteria. Is this a pathogen? Is part of the skin flora? Or maybe from licking, from bathing? So one thing that you can do is first check about the clinical correlation of Burkholderia. And if you look, probably it's the primary pathogen. This has been reported as a main agent for this entity, the frunculosis after grooming. Eh? It's true that the main bacteria causing this poor grooming folliculitis and frunculosis is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, that is in the water, that this is everywhere. But in this study, they already detected Burkholderia, and then this has been reported several times. So if you have doubts about one microorganism, checking the correlation of the bacteria with the clinical presentation is pretty useful. And, and this, we know that this entity is very easy to treat. In most of the cases, these gram-negative microorganisms respond well to quinolone, so in all cases, this is an easy to, to solve situation. So the first thing is clarify if there is a bacteria and if it's the, the pathogen of the condition. The second part is to do an antimicrobial susceptibility test and to identify what is the best antibiotic to be used against this microorganism. Usually the labs uh, do this with two different methods. The classic Kirby Bauer agar diffusion method that we learned at the school, where you put discs and then you measure the inhibition of the growth. And now many are moving to this second method that is the minimum inhibitory concentration or MIC that is more precise. And it would be better when they put different dilutions of the uh, culture with different concentration of the antimicrobial and decide if it's resistant or not. Probably the MIC method is a little bit uh, more accurate, but both methods have limitations. They are not perfect. They are only a guide to make a decision. Huh? Um, they are reliable when they are used to common bacteria, Staphylococcus, Enterobacteria, Pseudomonas, in systemic infections treated with systemic antibiotics. But they cannot be useful for uncommon bacteria, for instance, nocardia, actinomyces, mycobacteria. In these cases, probably we prefer to use guideline recommendations. And also it's not useful when you, you, for instance, are going to treat topically, huh? one common mistake is uh, to do cultures from otic infections, from ear canal infections, and to do a culture, do the antibiogram or susceptibility testing, and select the antibiotic based on that. 
this is not useful. It's wasting your time because what they give you as information is if these bacteria will be resistant or susceptible when treated systemically with an antibiotic, not when the antibiotic is applied topically directly to the bacteria, because in this case, the concentration is much higher, and also in the lab, it looks like resistant when you apply tons of enrofloxacin or polymyxin or gentamicin on the bacteria directly, they can be susceptible. So it's a question of concentration. So you have to understand there are limits. Okay, we can skip that. Uh, usually, as you know, the sus uh, sensitivity report, susceptibility report indicates if it's susceptible, resistant, or the intermediate. And we tend to use if possible, only those that are susceptible, avoid intermediate and resistant bacteria. Huh? Um, the resistance is a phenomenon that is growing everywhere in all types of, uh, for all types of antibiotics. The most common one is in, in dermatology is the resistance to beta-lactams antibiotics with a mechanism that is called methicillin resistant because of the presence of this gene called MYC-A that causes resistance of the microorganisms to all beta-lactams. It is important to understand that these bacteria that are resistant to one or several anti families of antibiotics are not more pathogenic. They are not causing more severe infections. The severity is the same. The, let's say, the type of presentation is the same. It's only that you cannot use this antibiotic. You cannot, just looking at the clinical presentation, say probably is a resistant mean bacteria because the lesions that they cause are exactly the same. It's not more severe an infection cause, but one of these resistant mm, staphs or other microorganisms. So the most important of the uh, resistance that we are dealing with is methicillin resistant. This is a problem worldwide because 20 years ago, about 10% of the staff pseudo-intermediates were methicillin resistant. Now in some parts of Europe, in the US, about 60% of the isolates are methicillin resistant. So if you use any of the beta-lactams, amoxicillin with clavulanate, uh, cephalosporins, the bacteria has become completely resistant. And also because it's resistant to the staphs, to the beta-lactams, they develop more and more resistance. And we are dealing in most of the cases with multi-resistant bacteria. I will show you a couple of examples. So what happens with these methicillin-resistant microorganisms is that they incorporate one piece of genetic material called MYC-A, this mobile gene, and this MYC-A gene codify a protein called PBP2A, protein, penicillin binding protein 2A, that protect completely the bacteria from beta-lactam antibiotics. You can change the antibiotic, use high, higher doses, but this protein rejects all the beta-lactam antibiotics. So this is a, a, a very common mechanism. So when you read the uh, susceptibility report, you have to identify the uh, resistant organism uh, and also some cross-reactions. For instance, if it's resistant to erythromycin, usually, will be also resistant to lincomycin, so there are few cross-reactions. Let's see one, one example. This dog had a very severe deep pyoderma affecting usually the, typically the distal legs. The dog was very mean because of the, the chronicity of the lesions, was protected and was sedated, and you see how deep the infection was, what need to be protected because of the pain, couldn't almost, no, 
walk. Now you see, a, if you do a cytology, uh, parasites, the is all negative. The cytology reveals neutrophils and, and cocci. You see there. We need to, to collect the sample for bacteriology here. The best will be to take a biopsy, a tissue biopsy, and submit it to the lab because this area will be very contaminated on the, on the legs. And here is the result of the culture and susceptibility. Staphs intermediates, four plus, so we know that this is the primary pathogen. This Escherichia coli, very weak growth, probably a secondary uh, or contaminant. And when you read the report, it say that it's only susceptible to aminoglycosides, rifampicin, chloramphenicol, and fusidic acid. That is an antibiotic that we can only use topically. This is a very common profile. So many methicillin resistant staphylococci intermediates end like this. They lose susceptibility to all things. And then at the end, they are only susceptible to aminoglycosides, to rifampicin and glucuronphenicol, because we don't use too much these antibiotics. They are not prescriptions that we do every day. Eh? And fusidic acid, that is only topical. So it's difficult to make a choice because these, we know that nephrotoxic, they need to be given subcutaneously, you cannot give oral. We're going to need a treatment six weeks, eight weeks in a deep pyoderma. So it's not very practical to give gentamicin such a long period of time. Rifampicin, we know that it's a good antibiotic, but has side effects mainly hepatotoxicity, some dogs vomit. Chloramphenicol, the same, old antibiotic, side effects. One third of the dog have weakness, some others have diarrhea, so it's not well tolerated. Needs to be given three times a day, so every eight hours. So also not a good choice. Huh? Fusidic acid, topical, not a fantastic situation with this very ulcerated pause. So in this case, I decided, if you read this wonderful paper by Mark Papik, say that these two are probably the best options for treating methicillin resistant staph. So rifampin and chloramphenicol um, for methicillin resistant pyoderma in dogs. So that's um, a clear recommendation. So we started in this case to use rifampicin. Uh, uh, this has been now very well established. There is a more recent paper showing that it can be a very good choice for methicillin resistant staphylococci. And the lowest dose, five milligram per kick, is usually enough to control the, the infection for four weeks only. If you continue more than four weeks, usually the bacteria become resistant to rifampicin. This has been studied. So what you can do is use three, four weeks of rifampicin, and then continue when the ulcers are closed with topical treatment, fusidic acid or chlorexidine. It's true that in this paper, it was demonstrated that hepatotoxicity was present in some dogs, so you need to do a blood work. I usually do this every week, every seven to 10 days, to check for <coughs> ALT and liver enzymes. And we, we treat this with 150, maybe the weight was about 30 kilograms for four weeks. We repeated the CBC serum chemistry every seven days, and you see that the lesions closed, and the, the, and the was maintained from that point, was maintained only with topical treatment. Okay, let's go back to our previous case. This is our dog with pyoderma secondary to atopic dermatitis. We have decided that because the dog has been on treatment with antibiotics recently, and because it has a relapse in pyoderma, we want to do a culture. We don't want to repeat tefalexin again or tefovexin subcutaneously. We want to do a culture and know what is the microorganism. And it, this is the culture and susceptibility of this dog. Staphs intermediates, as expected. Susceptibility, here you have the, in this case, with discs. 
you have the inhibition. Huh? So fusidic acid seems to be susceptible. Amikacin also. Typrofloxacin, nothing. Clindamycin, nothing. Doxycycline, resistant too. Enrofloxacin, nothing. Erythromycin, nothing. Gentamicin, nothing. Marbofloxacin, again, nothing. So quinolones, nothing. Oxacillin, not effective. So when we see oxacillin in the susceptibility report, this is usually put to tell you that this is a methicillin resistant staphylococci that has the MEC A gene. It's not because we are going to use oxacillin. Nobody uses oxacillin anymore on Earth. It's just an information for you to say, doctor, it's methicillin resistant. Don't try any beta lactam antibiotic because they are not going to work. So it's a marker. They say rifampicin is a good option too. Sulfatrimetoprim, no. Tetracycline, also no. So in fact, what we know from this, we know that it's a staph pseudo intermediate, that it's methicillin resistant, and it's multi drug resistant. Because we call multi drug resistant with more than, when more than three families of antibiotics are marked as resistant. And we have resistance to uh, all beta lactams, to the uh, quinolones, to erythromycin, to tetracycline. So it's clearly a multi drug resistant. It's methicillin resistant and multi drug resistant. What can we do? Well, uh, basically, these are the options. They are not very good. Again, fusidic acid, rifampicin, and amikacin. Bad news. Uh, as you see, this is a profile that is repeated hmm, in many methicillin resistant staph to intermediates. So if we compare the three choices that we have, fusidic acid is topical, is medium high in price because in, in most European countries you only have a cream with fusidic acid 2% and a cream cannot be applied to all the spots. So you need to order a pharmaceutical compounded 2% uh, fusidic acid in solution that can be prepared but it's more expensive. And also, they need the, the tutor or, or the guardian twice a day applies the, the treatment. Huh? Amikacin, it's difficult because it's subcutaneous, has renal anotic toxicity on the long term. And rifampin, it's again, we know hepatic toxicity. Cost is low, need for dedication is not too high. It's low, just twice a day, and no, no injections, not going to the clinic every day, it seems to be. Yeah. But uh, to me, also, this again looks like as an option. In a superficial pyoderma, we have another possibility. It's simply use topical treatment. In, in many cases of methicillin resistant infection or non methicillin resistant infections, the use simply of chlorexidine, if the owners are going to follow a strictly your recommendation, it's demonstrated as probably the best option. And there are several studies showing that. So before in this case that is very superficial, before going to a more complex and aggressive treatment like rifampine, as in the previous case that we have seen, we can try chlorexidine 4%. Uh, these are other cases of superficial pyoderma. You see the classic multifocal alopecia, the epidermal colorets, just treated with 3% chlorexidine shampoo. And you see that in three weeks, they, the lesion's clear. So we have this. And being methicillin resistant doesn't mean that it's resistant to chlorexidine. Resistance to chlorexidine has been reported very, very rarely. So most methicillin resistant staphylococci are susceptible to chlorexidine. So if the owners are willing to bathe the dog every day or every two days, this is an option for this guy. So we can begin with this. We can begin simply with all fusidic acid topically, 
or chlorhexidine topically. Eh? And this is what we did. We come at the beginning, we start with fusidic acid in a spray, and then we continue with simply chlorhexidine. And then the dog resolved completely. So in superficial pyodermas, before moving to the more complex antibiotics like trifampine or chloramphenicol that I use in some cases, or even more fancy antibiotics, try, if the owners can, the topical treatment with fusidic acid or simply with chlorhexidine because it's, it's extremely effective. And that's it. I think we have reviewed in uh, cases of suspected bacterial infection, how to use, the, how to obtain the samples, how to interpret the results of the test, the mechanism of resistance, and how to treat multidrug resistant bacteria. In superficial cases, if possible, we will try to use chlorhexidine, fusidic acid topically. In deep infections, we will use old antibiotics if we are dealing with a multidrug or methicillin resistant staphylococcus intermediates like chloramphenicol, rifampine, and usually are the last that are um, present as uh, effective in these very resistant microorganisms. And remember that the clinical picture that cause a methicillin resistant and a non-methicillin resistant is identical. So just looking at the patient, we don't know if this is a resistant bacteria or not. It can be very mild lesions that are caused by a resistant bacteria and can very severe lesions be produced by a non-resistant bacteria. So the resistance is not related to pathogenicity. There are different genes and proteins that cause pathogenicity, okay? And I'm happy to answer any question. If there are. Anyone? You can try. Cats? Yes, herpes, herpes virus. Uh, skin lesions with uh, necrotizing areas. Uh, is it, do you ha had any experience with the dogs with skin lesions with herpes virus? No. Um, the herpes virus in dogs, what causes usually is more um, puppy uh, acute death because of systemic infection. But there is not an herpes virus causing a similar condition in, in dogs, as far as I know. Why am I asking? Sorry. Uh, yes, yes, we, we, we know about herpes uh, pathog pathogenicity in, in dogs. But uh, I had one case. It was ac accidental because I was not in my work. I, was, uh, I went to a uh, grooming mm -hmm. um, place and I saw the dog. It's, uh, a Sharpie, uh, he is from uh, a rescue center. Mm -hmm. He's very severe skin uh, inflamed. I just, I was ready with a um, slide to take the sample from, from the skin, which surprised me. And now I'm looking at the cat's uh, uh, ulcerative yes, uh, face and the cytology you, you, you showed. It's um, what surprised me, I first time saw in Sharpie a uh, lots of eosinophils mm -hmm. in the skin area, which is hypercarotin, uh, hypo, um, short, uh, s very thick. Or yeah, thick. So, yes, very thick. And I supposed to see a lot of bacteria. Uh, yes, it was bacteria, not so much because he already was treated with antibiotics, and it was huge amount of eosinophils and what I saw in cytology in some cells I saw some infiltrates in uh, uh, these bodies uh, uh, inclusion bodies yes inclusion mean. bodies which just now I start to think may we have the case 
there has not been reported, and I have never seen that, but it's um, inclusion body, it, it, it could be that is uh, an herpes virus in dogs. There are some herpes virus in dogs, only that this type of condition has not been reported. I don't know, sometimes it's difficult to identify properly the inclusion bodies because there could be other inclusions, could be nucleoli that are big. So usually you have seen that we confirm that with an antibody against herpes virus. You can also do electron microscopy, but and, um, you need to confirm that with, uh, with immunostochemistry. If you, you don't have a biopsy of that. Uh, no, really, no. No, no we, we, with we, a biopsy, we you, can we plan can do now it. because the talk was very just accidental yeah, for yeah. me. Yeah. But with the biopsy, one other option is that you can do immunostochemistry later because you have the block in paraffin, the new, new section, and you can do immunostochemistry later. Thank you very much. More questions? Aš norėjau paklaus būtent dėl mėginio paimimo iš ausies. Dėl to, kad vieta yra ypatinga ir su iškirom susimaišo. Kaip geriausiai paimt, kad būtų tikslinga, dėl ko kartuojasi uždygimas ir kaip nustatyti geriausią atsparumą? Thank you. This is a very good question. In, in general, when we collect samples from the ear canal, if we have only otitis externa, the sample is collected from the point, the, uh, point where the vertical and the horizontal ear canal join. You do the swap here, and you collect the sample. But this sample usually is done for cytology only. It's not useful to do cultures of the external ear canal because we are going to use antibiotics in high concentration and the susceptibility test will not inform about the, the resistance or not of this. If we have a problem with the uh, inner ear, with, the ot with otitis media or otitis interna, in this case, because we are going to use systemic antibiotic, we need a sample and we need a susceptibility testing. What we do is, in general, first we uh, take a sample of the external ear canal for cytology. Then we put the dog under anesthesia and do a CT of the middle ear to see if there is content in the bulla. If the bullas are clean and the medium and inner ear are okay, we simply treat externally there with drops with antibiotic. If the bulla is full of exudate, then you need to collect a sample of that exudate. And what we do is in the same anesthesia with the amerongotomy and directly go to the bulla, collect the sample, and this is sent to the lab. Because we're going to treat this middle ear infection systemically, we need the susceptibility testing. So summarizing, if there is only external ear canal infection, you don't need to do cultural susceptibility. You simply treat topically. If there is internal infection, then you need to collect a sample of the bulla, and then in this case, you need to do susceptibility testing. In many cases, what vets do is do cultural and susceptibility of the external ear canal. And if you do that, you will see that this, the microorganism are changing, the isolates and also the susceptibility. And this is not a way to solve that. Probably the primary cause is or the inner infection or a sec or underlying disease, atopic dermatitis, allergic dermatitis, that is causing this. So it's different if the infection is external or internal. We only use systemic treatment for the middle ear infection, okay? Using um, systemic antibiotics to treat an external ear canal infection only create resistances. You don't need to give by mouth antibiotics if the infection is only located in the external ear canal. And doing the, let's say, otoscopic examination, even if you see an intact tympanic membrane, 
doesn't mean that there is no infection on the other side because the tympanic membrane closes in between two and four weeks. So you can have um, infection of the ear canal, the rupture of the tympanic membrane, the penetration of the infection in the bulla, and the closing of that. And then you look and see, okay, it seems that it's only external. And you can have the infection on the other side, no clinical signs of inner otitis, and then treating the infections that are here with systemic antibiotics or based on susceptibility testing is not an effective way of solving that. You don't need to do a MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. Simply a CT, it's enough to identify if there is infection in the bulla. Mario Paklaus del Vietos, jeigu būna lupos, ar ten, kur būna drėgmės, susikaupo sprienosies, ir paprastas gydimas ne visada padeda dėl to, kad gyvūnas gali nulažyti. Ir dėl rygmės sunkiai gyjimas, kaip tada daroma ir biopsija dėl gyjimo, kad nepakenk dar daugiau, jeigu tu neįsitikinės. Ir kaip pato gydyt geriausiai, kad tą žaizdą sutvarkyt. Raušlės lūpos nuose. The question is how take biopsies from areas of, let's say, mucocutaneous junctions, I think lips, nose, anus, or these moist areas or areas between the mucosa and the skin. Unfortunately, many conditions affect these areas. And then it's a place where we need to biopsy in many occasions. So we cannot uh, avoid doing that. For instance, um, a very common condition in dogs is um, epitheliotropic lymphoma and tends to target the nose, the lips, the anogenital mucosa or the junction, so we need to biopsy these areas frequently. Um, the only recommendation I can give you is to use a six millimeter punch and close the area, and that's it. We cannot do much more. Uh, of course, if there are alternatives to the biopsy, we prefer to do that. If we can have information with cytology, uh, we do that, but in many occasions, with these mucocutaneous junctions, we need to do a biopsy. One thing that you can do is to, if the, list, the area you think it's, uh, according to cytology, um, infected with bacteria, you can use some topical treatment or even a systemic antibiotic to reduce the, the uh, infection, uh, or even to try to solve the situation. A common problem is mucocutaneous pyoderma. Mucocutaneous pyoderma that you see typically in middle-aged German shepherds on the nose and lips. Um, it's very difficult to, to separate clinically from discoid lupus erythematosus, from mucocutaneous lupus, from the uh, proliferative arteriopathy of the German shepherd, from the um, philtrum arteriopathy, so there are five or six conditions that look very similar clinically, and they are difficult to, to separate. And of course, as you say, taking a biopsy of the nose is not a, a very pleasing intervention. So in many cases, what you do, because mucocutaneous pyoderma is common and uh, usually responds well to a treatment with antibiotic, we use antibiotic first and see if it's improving and if you have a good result with systemic or topical antibiotic, you consider that this was a mucocutaneous pyoderma and you don't do the biopsy. If, despite being on antibiotic, the lesion remains on the alar fold or on the filtrum or on the nasal planum, then you need to biopsy and you need to make, make the holes on the nose. That is worse. But in this case, clearly you need to separate, separate different problems. What I don't do now that I'm becoming old, it's many nail fold biopsies. Unless I suspect a squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, for instance, when I was younger, for this lupoid onychitis, this onychodystrophia uh, lupoide of the nails, I did many biopsies because I wanted to know exactly this is this condition, the onychitis, the lupoid onychitis. Um, now, I try to make the diagnosis clinically because I, there are not many conditions that can be confused with that. 
maybe leishmaniasis in some cases, but you can do serology. And then if I suspect that this is symmetric, onychodystrophy, I simply treat and I see the results. So I try to, <laughs> this is a difficult question, but I would say if you have an alternative to biopsy, do this, antibiotic treatment. If you really need to do a biopsy, there's no alternative. In some cases, I think justified to do a biopsy. Any other question? Visada prideda prednizolona ir dexamitazona dažniausiai, nu rašo, kad pripulingų infekcijų jo vartot negalima. Jūsų gydime nemačiau, kad jūs nevartojat garmonus, bet retkarčiai, kad nuslopint požymius, būna ar tikslingai vest tabletės minimaliom dozėm. Kada atsikartojančios būklės arba sunkiai pagydoma, arba gydimą suštrunka 30 dienų, 20, gal tada sumažintų kursas antibiotikų, sumažėtų, jeigu būtų vartojami garmoniniai vaistai mažom dozėm. Now the question is if we can add some steroids to reduce the antibiotic duration at the beginning. Um, I do this, for instance, with the ear canal. When, I, when we have otitis, we know that uh, topical antibiotics can help to reduce the hyperplasia of the wall and in some cases help to, to reduce the, the duration of the antibiotic. In um, other skin infections, uh, depends a little bit on the, of the situation. If you have, for instance, a dog with atopic dermatitis that is well diagnosed and has a flare, using some steroids for a short period of time, a low dose, can help to reduce the itching and to reduce the inflammation of the skin, and maybe if there's an infection, to help to normalize the skin. In other cases, for instance, with dermatophytes, with all the deep infection, no cardia, bulholderia, it's better not to use anti-inflammatory doses of steroids. So it depends a little bit on each case. I'll, if you use the doses below one milli, milligram per kilo, usually do not affect the, let's say, the immune response, even the innate immunity of the skin. So you can use short period of time. If you are trying to control pruritus, then we have better options than the steroids now. We can use the cytopoint or we can use uh, apoquel so that you have alternative to do that. But I, I'm not using this always. In some cases, you can. They can be useful. <laughs> 